I am Jimbo Paris, and you are listening to the Jimbo Paris Show. All right. So today we have Kim McIntyre, and she's from Orlando, Florida, and she is focused on stress relief and laughter. And basically, she's the founder and CEO of Joyful Being Transformations. And she essentially is focused a lot on self-help, but mainly improving the level of happiness that people have. Hey. <laughs> How's it going? Good. How's it going with you? Thanks for having me. Great. So kind of to begin, what do you sort of specifically do? So I help people who know they want to enjoy their lives more, they're stressed out, but they can't quite figure out how to do it in the middle of everything they've got going on. Like they have the best of intentions, <laughs> but they don't quite uh, manifest what they want. So for example, people will often say phrases like, enjoy the journey or stop and smell the roses or laughter is the best medicine, but then to actually live it. And even if put a little bit more of it into your life, it needs to be more than just words that you say. So it's really about needing to see the value of what laughter and joy and enjoyment can provide for you. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Now, before we get into more detail and I just want to ask you, what is uh, joy? What is joy? Okay, so there can be many different <laughs> definitions of joy. For me, it's sort of like the sweet moments of life. It's like joy is very much something that comes out of the moment. You know, I think of mm. happiness as maybe a broader topic of whether you're happy with your life or happy with your circumstances. But joy is just an experience of now that is filled with something that lifts you up, that makes you feel good, right? So that's my definition. But if you ask different people, they can tell you different things. And so actually, uh, one of the free resources on my website, the free resources of questions for people to kind of find that answer for themselves and discover what is joy for me? What brings me joy? And because sometimes if you ask people, you know, what is joy for you or what brings you joy? They kind of draw a blank. Like, I don't know. You know, I, it does not really even on my radar. Right. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Good answer. And just to, just to kind of go back to where we were talking here, how long have you actually been in this industry? I uh, got started like 2001 when I was facing a health challenge. And I went to this support group for people who were facing health challenges. And amongst the different things we did, one of the things we did was daily laughter and play, therapeutic laughter <laughs> and play. And it felt like a light bulb turning on inside of me, like lighting me back up after all the stress in my life and the stress of what I was dealing with, with the health challenge. And it just felt like coming home to me, to the true me. And then, um, I decided, you know, I want to teach what I'd learned to other people. And so I started not not too long after that to um, to do that. And I've been teaching to groups on and off for over 20 years. And I don't know if it's really an industry or not, but it's just um, it's something I love to do. I love to do it in person. And and now I've developed taken some of my in-person live classes that I've done and I've created little online mini programs that people can kind of do at their own pace to kind of spark that for them, kind of jumpstart joy and happiness for themselves. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Hmm. And can you kind of give us a bit of um, maybe the history of your career? How did this all sort of begin? But that's, that's what it began. It began with that, with that health challenge and me okay. realizing that. And then, but then not long after that, I saw uh, an advertisement for a training for certified laughter leaders. And I'm like, what is this? Because at that point I'd finished the support group program and I was like, 
Jones and for my laughter fix every day. And I went to that training. I like booked a flight right away, bought my ticket, mm -hmm. went to the training and really haven't looked back. <laughs> so, uh, so I combined what I learned in that training with what I learned in that support group, kind of created my own thing with it. And then I just started finding places. Like I ran my own little private group for a while in Orlando for about five years. And then from that word of mouth spread and different groups would come and ask me to speak. And, and that's kind of how it all began. Yeah. Do you use certain types of terminology on the mm -hmm. website, like um, joyful self. Can mm -hmm. you kind of give a bit of um, an answer on what your uh, what, what this joyful self is? I think it's a part of you that some people might think as your inner lighthearted self or playful mm. self. It's really a part of you that for a lot of people in the stress of our world, that part of you doesn't get out much, right? <laughs> that part of you doesn't get out to play because there's a lot of beliefs about I should be productive, you know, every waking moment. I should push, 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 drive, drive, drive. And all of that stuff is great. Having drive and accomplishment is all really important part of life. But if you don't balance it out, then you burn yourself out and then you're no good to anybody, right? So, so the joyful self... For me, it's when I did that laughter, when I did that support group back in 2001 and I got in touch with that part of myself, that's what the joyful self is. It's just this part that's kind of lighthearted and playful and willing to have a sense of humor and open up to see joy in the simple things in life. Yeah. Whether it's the simple things could be seeing the value in laughing and connecting with a friend or seeing some time, making some time to enjoy a hobby that's relaxing for you or literally taking time to stop and smell flowers. I mean, it can be very something very, very simple that taps you into that joyful part of yourself. And sometimes people think it needs to be some big, huge thing, you know, because huge events can be joyful, right? A wedding or a birth of a child or something like that. But it can also be the small little things. And I think people postpone what they think joy is or postpone putting activities like that in their life. They think, oh, I'll get to it someday. But then you never get to it, right? You never let it happen. So you need to find a way to weave it into your everyday life more and more. And um, that's that's the value of it because it lights you up. It gives you energy. It refuels you, recharges you. And so often people discount it or say that it's frivolous, but it's actually vital energy life force for living your life and having a fulfilling life. You know, um, I find this very, very interesting because when I look at you and I take a good look at you, um, <laughs> you definitely give off that vibe. That's why I was smiling a bit while you were talking, yeah. you know? Yeah. How, um, when did you first, uh, kind of become like this? Were you always like this personality wise? I think as a child, I probably was. Okay. Right. I think as a kid, that's pretty much who I was. <laughs> mm -hmm. And um, actually my mom would, would tell me that, you know, um, but I think growing up and then I was also shy. I was playful, but I was kind of shy. And so I think growing up teen years, twenties, thirties, life starts to pile on. And that part of me got buried a bit. You know, back in the day, back as my teenagers and in my 20s, I was doing theater a lot. So I loved exploring different characters. And, and there's there was a sense of play and love of that. So Am I this way 24-7? Not necessarily. I mean, I have moods like everybody else. You know, I, it's, you know it's not about being perfectionistic about being joyful. You know, it's just making a little more space for it. For yourself and and knowing that in doing that it's not just a gift for you it's a gift for everybody around you because it's something that gets shared and is spread through the people that you care about in your life and even through the people you don't hardly know you know just acquaintances at the grocery store or the bank you know you can you can spread that joy and that fun there too yeah and actually my part of my husband is like that 
um, I was, you know, we first met back in my 20s. I was super, super shy, right? And to him, there are no strangers. So we be at a grocery store and he would be like, just making people laugh and joking around. And then, and they look, you know, the cashier would look at me and go, you live with this guy. And I'm like, yeah, I do. And he makes me laugh and I appreciate it so much. Yeah. So it's finding the people also in your life who bring that in for you. You know, I feel like if you have an awareness of what that is for you, then you can be proactive and go seek that out and pick up the phone and call or go look for the thing or seek out the thing that makes you laugh or lifts you up. Now let's kind of jump back to the joyful self now. Do you think there are any um, misconceptions that people might have about the joyful self? You explain what the joyful self was, but do you think somebody else that you may be trying to teach your client or someone mm -hmm. else it may not have ever heard of the name. Would mm -hmm. they have a certain um, perception of it, of what it means that could be wrong? Um, I think that even though I defined it, there's not necessarily one clear definition. Okay. So someone else's joyful self may feel slightly different to them. You know, maybe they don't feel it as a self. Maybe they just feel it as an in the moment thing. And so the word joyful self doesn't speak to them and the word joy does. That's great. You know, um, I, I think if there is a misconception, it would be that once you've inhabited your joyful self, you're not allowed to do anything else or be any have any other mood or do anything else so they might uh, okay. think of it as in a perfection perfectionistic way and i think some people have labeled that as like toxic positivity where you're trying to be all of that but it's not really organic and it's not really real and so like one of the advice that i often give people if if joyful self feels too far away if joy feels too far away to look for something smaller to look for a way to bring the energy of comfort in. So maybe joy is too far of a stretch, but finding something that's comforting to you or soothing to you might be headed and leaning in that direction, but not such a big, huge expectation that you think you can never fill, you know, does that make sense? Yeah. yeah you raise a good point because I think when some people may look at, you know, this self joy, they might think, Oh, you know, I have to be happy all the time and mm. I can't really be human and okay. Mm -mm. No, no, no. It's a, it's about, see what I feel like being human is, is great. But I think what our ancestors were programmed to, if you see the negative thing first, it helps you to survive. So they call it negativity bias, that you're biased to mm. see the negative thing. And what I'm talking about is balancing that out you know, so that there's at least some space in your life to experience whatever joy, enjoyment, laughter, what that is for you and discovering that for yourself. So it's really a bit of balance. You know, it's not necessarily an all or nothing thing. Mm, okay. <laughs> yeah. And I, and I, that could be a misconception that people have. Well, what are uh, 10 questions people need to ask themselves to achieve self joy? Well, that's actually my free giveaway on my website. So if they want those 10 questions, they just go there and download them. And it's really, those questions are for to start a spark of the discovery process. You know, mm -hmm. you really look at what is it for you, you know, because not everybody's the same. Not everybody finds joy in the same things. Not everybody laughs at the same things. And so rather than me giving you a formula here, do A, B, C, and D, that may not work for everybody. Uh, what works for me may not work for you. So it's really, you can just go and uh, start with that worksheet to start reclaiming joy for yourself. Yeah. So I don't have all those questions memorized, <laughs> but but a question you could start with is, do I value joy? Do I okay. want more joy? And if you do, then you can dive deeper into it, you know, and, and most people do want more joy. They want to feel good. You know, 
you you know you know you like to laugh. Laughter feels amazing. So, yeah. Clients, what types of clients do you focus on specifically? Is there any specific um, demographic you try and work with the most, or is it just everyone? Um, it tends to be women. Not when I'm hmm. speaking. When I'm speaking to large groups, they're just large groups of people. But the people who tend to want to go deeper with me tend to be women. And uh, sometimes I would say anywhere from their 30s to their 70s in different different phases of their lives. Um, and they're usually looking for how can I be different in my life and still go for my goals? So it's like going for your goals in a way that doesn't tear you down, if that makes sense. It's finding finding a way in that is their way that is less stressful, but still moving forward. Cause the opposite is sometimes people can get stuck completely. And if they get, you know, too much fear looking at what the next thing is. So we want to look at the next thing with a plan and some optimism and some self care baked in to make it easier for you. It's, it's just so much fun to laugh and to, Laughter is that contagious energy that just naturally spreads. When you hear someone laugh, it makes you want to laugh. Like, I think there's like a YouTube video I saw of someone who did a laughter experiment where they just would go stand at a bus stop or a train station and start laughing just for no reason. And they'd be like listening to something on their phone or pretending and they're just laughing. And then like the laughter would just spread to everybody. And it, it in an instant can lift you up and make you feel better. So I feel like if the drug companies could make something that made you feel that good that quickly, <laughs> they would make a fortune from it. But fortunately, laughter's free. So you can give yourself a little dose anytime you want to seek out some laughter, you know? So, and so what I, what I teach is like how to find that for yourself. Um, and um, again, it's different for different people because not everybody has the same sense of humor, but it's the same messages with joy as being proactive to to look for it. And and one misconception people often have about laughter is that you need to be in a good mood first. Right. And yeah. you don't actually need to be in a good mood first. <laughs> you think of a time when you felt super down or grouchy or irritable and someone comes along surprisingly and makes you laugh, you feel better in an instant. So you didn't have to be in a good mood first to laugh. So, so even if you're and if you're in a bad mood, that's when laughter could be the most good. <laughs> you know? So that's, that's a time to, um, you know, again, compassion, if you can't get yourself there and you can't get yourself to laugh, that's okay too. You know, we're not doing that, you know, forced thing, but yeah, that's what I've heard about with some of these clubs. They just tell you to laugh about things or. Well, that's that's what you're talking about is laughter yoga. And that's part of what I have taught in the past is laughter yoga. Um, okay. But with laughter yoga, I teach it a little different than other people do, because sometimes mm. like the laughter yoga people will just be all like, rah, rah, let's go, <laughs> you know, and I kind of like set it up for people to understand the value of it and why we're doing it and that, that there's some science behind it, you know, and yeah. so that they understand that their body can't tell the difference between the fake laugh and the real thing. And I also make sure that they're really aware of how it's impacting them. So I'll, we'll sit first, we'll breathe, and they'll do like a self check-in on, on what, what, how they're feeling. And then we'll do some of the exercises and then you come back and do a check-in again and notice if they feel different. And almost everybody does if they actually try it, you know. But some people, it's too much of a stretch. And laughter yoga isn't for them. And that's okay, too. And I give people permission always when I do that portion of it to say, if you don't want to join in, you can just sit and smile and enjoy watching the rest of us laugh. And, you know, what happens is sometimes they hear the sound of other people laughing and they start laughing anyway, you know. So, yes, laughter is more... Um, enjoyable when you can find what makes you laugh organically, but it's beneficial either way. So that's the theory behind the laughter yoga. And 
I, I try to do it a little more gently with people uh, when I do do that portion, but that's not the whole picture. You know, no. the, the rest of the picture is finding is similar going on that discovery process for yourself of what makes you laugh, you know, and knowing that so that you can then seek that out. I think that's the big one because um, I think the biggest gripe I've noticed is that I wouldn't even say it's the science. Okay. I'm not that mm -hmm. type of person, but um, it's more so the, the way it's, it sometimes just looks very um, unnatural. You yeah. Know? It, it looks more like something you're forcing out rather than right. something that just comes up, you know, in the moment. Right. So are you trying to make it more natural? Is that it? Or um, does it become natural? Forgive me with all the questions. but uh, I think so. Yes. Sometimes forcing it makes the natural come and sometimes it doesn't. So it is, so I like to set it up in the such of thinking of like, you're a kid playing make-believe or you're an actor playing a role. So it's not so much like you're forcing yourself yeah, as yeah. let's try this on in a playful way, you know, and see how it goes. So um, maybe it's my theater training, but it sounds more natural when it comes out of me. Like I can just do it like... <laughs> You know, and it, and it sounds more, you know, but I know what you mean. Like you see people going, ha, ha, <laughs> you know, on YouTube videos or whatever. And it, and it looks like a bit much, but you would be surprised even when you do that, right? That's not necessarily what I do with my people, but even doing that, it moves the energy in, in your body. It gets your body moving. It gets, it gets you it breaks the cycle because what happens is you get that negative mind cycle, like a gerbil on a wheel. And it, it's a total interrupt of that in a good way. So, um, yeah. So, but you know what? That's not everybody's jam. So <laughs> that's, that's why I say it's not the whole picture, you know? So it's just as important to know um, what makes you laugh or maybe more importantly, who makes you laugh? So you, because laughter is something that connects people, that bonds people, that helps people through challenges and help each other through challenges. Um, but you also have to know that not everybody has your sense of humor. So sometimes humor that's kind of like a put down humor. Uh, some people, they do that jibing back and forth kind of humor, and they know that that's what they do, and they know they're not taking it seriously, and it works for them. But if you try that with somebody else, they might take offense and be offended and feel like, hey, you're putting me down, you're making fun of me. And so you just need to be aware of the humor styles of the people around you, especially like in a workplace environment. You just need to be aware of that. Mm -hmm. um, because, you know, and if you do offend somebody, not to say, Oh, come on. I was just kidding. You know, but to really say, oh, I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to offend you, you know, to actually just quick apology that takes care of it. You know, it's worth the risk to put yourself out there <laughs> to try to make somebody laugh and then apologize afterwards if it didn't go well. <laughs> you know, it's, it's definitely worth the risk because it really does build connections between people. When it comes to sort of practicing self-love, do you think you can give anyone any type of advice? Hmm. I think the biggest piece of advice I would give, and you know, you ask anybody to answer this question, they might give different advice, right? But I would say that awareness is key to, to self-love and to everything I've been talking about. You know, if you don't know that you're judging yourself harshly in your head, you know, if you're not aware of when it's happening, then it's hard to counteract it with self-love and compassion because it takes off and has steam. So it starts with awareness. And, you know, maybe that's my, my yoga background talking because yoga is very much about awareness in the moment of what you're feeling, how your body feels, where your thoughts are at, and building that moment to moment awareness can help you realize when you need to give yourself a little extra self-love. Um, 
that that's one piece of advice. I mean, there's, there's self-love is so key to, um, I think to being able to feel joyful, you know, to being able to share that with people, because if you don't love yourself and you're miserable, then joy could even feel uncomfortable or threatening or someone else's joy could make you feel uncomfortable or threatened. Um, so loving yourself and that means loving yourself where you are in all your imperfections, you know, because nobody's perfect. Um, having that compassion for yourself as a human being where you are that, you know, we all get different emotions. We all have downs. We all have ups. We all have different challenges and situations we're facing. And you know what? We're not going to do it perfect. We're going to make mistakes. We're going to screw up. We're, you know, it's part of life. And so when you love yourself, you can have compassion for that and you can self-talk to yourself like, it's okay. You made a mistake. You'll fix what you can and then we'll move on from here, you know? Okay. This was a very good interview. Thank you. I, I enjoyed our conversation. You asked some very deep and interesting questions. So thank you so much. <laughs> All right. Well, good talk. Um, let's end this off here. So just a few shout outs. First one being uh, our special sponsor today is Judy Ryan. She's the CEO of LifeWork Systems. She's our affiliate partner, and she basically wants to help companies build a kind and collaborative culture. And mm. she basically has the main solution for you if you're a corporate business looking to, or any type of business looking to improve your infrastructure. Now, next thing, we have a YouTube channel. Subscribe to us now. We are slowly growing in subscribers. And then... Next thing we have to address is the Roku channel. This will be on Roku TV as well as all of our other episodes. So when that comes out, we'll let you know too. And yeah, thank you again, everyone. I'm Jimbo Paris. This is the Jimbo Paris Show. Thank you for listening to The Jimbo Parish Show.